Hi everybody, my name's Louise Brown. I manage the Health Professional Education Programs at Jean Hales and we're really excited to pre present our first webinar for 2018. Firstly, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners, the custodians of the land we're presenting on and the lands we're reaching tonight and pay respects to Elders past, present and future. For those of you who don't know, Jean Hales for Women's Health is a national not-for-profit organisation dedicated to improving the knowledge of women's health by combining research, clinical care and practical education for women and health professionals. We've had a huge number of registrations tonight, over 1,600, which is fabulous, our biggest ever, and at the moment we have hundreds of people online, so welcome everybody. Um, we're talking about vulval conditions tonight, and please keep in mind that we can only focus on a couple of the sort of the most important or the most common conditions and ones that might be overlooked as well, um, as that's all we've got time for in this format. We may have to do a Volvo part two, so stand by for that. Um, you can see the agenda on the bottom of your screen on the player page. You can submit questions you've already heard in the video by the ask a question button on the right hand side. We've had lots and lots of questions. Um, so unfortunately we might not be able to get to all your questions. Please don't keep putting them in because um, we have to sift through them. So if you've sent it once, we've seen it, we will try and get to it when we can. If you have technical problems, please use the number on the player page. You can call that and the Reb, uh, Rebback team will help you out. Don't submit it as a question. For those of you who haven't done one of our webinars before, welcome. We've got lots of new um, people tonight. If you're using an iPhone, it's not ideal um, and you will only see the video, you won't see the slides. You can print the slides out. There's a resource library tab um, and you can print the slides. We also emailed them to you today. Um, and in the resource folder, you'll find the pre-reading and some other useful resources. And you can download those later on before the end of the webinar. After the webinar closes, the resources aren't available or accessible, but next week, once the webinar's in our Jean Hales webinar library, you'll be able to go and print them there. Um, we'll send you an email when it's ready to view. So if you want RACGP points for this, um, or a certificate for those of you who are not GPs, you need to fill in the evaluation at the end of the webinar and the link will come up on the screen after we close. So I'd like to introduce you to our fantastic panel tonight. We've got Dr. Uh, Dr Tanya Boll, who's a dermatologist at Jean Hales, she specialises in vulval conditions. Um, we have Dr Catherine Cook on the far side, who's an obstetrician, gynaecologist and a sexual health physician. And she's the current president of the Australian and New Zealand Vulvovaginal Society. Dr Karen Burzens, next to Cathy, is a sexual health physician at the Melbourne he um, Sexual Health Centre and Mercy Hospital for Women, where she works with Catherine. We also have on the panel Dr Elizabeth Farrell, who's a Jean Hales gynaecologist, who's going to facilitate our discussion tonight. So we've got an amazing panel, and I welcome um, our panellists as well. So tonight is the largest webinar we've ever had, um, and I think it's really worth addressing why is that? Why is this such a popular topic? Um, I know from our point of view at Jean Hales, we get a huge number of women coming to our website looking for information on vulval irritation. So it's certainly an issue for women. Um, and health professionals keep saying to us, we want a vulval webinar. So we know that this is a problem that you're facing and maybe don't know how to manage. Um, and I know that the vulval clinics where the doctors work have extreme long waiting lists. So I think um, I'd just sort of like maybe to throw to you, Cathy, why do you, why do you think this is a situation um, in terms of expertise in vulva? And yes, look, that's a, that is the question, isn't it, Louise? Yeah. The, um, traditionally, it's been a very poorly, poorly taught area, both at the undergraduate and um, postgraduate levels, even in specialist training such as, as obstetrics and gynaecology, um, a lot of uh, trainees will go through without access to vulval clinics. So there's um, the teaching from the professional view, viewpoint, then there are the patients, um, there's still a lot of shame and uh, shyness in women coming forward, so we will, um, that can delay the presentation and often it can be a much more complex issue by the time it gets to us. And then the consultation itself, uh, these are not quick consultations. Um, we need to, and we will um, all have a turn in uh, making sure that you understand you have to take a thorough history, examination and investigations. And a lot of the women are elderly and simply getting them dressed and undressed takes a certain mm -hmm. amount of time. And then the conditions themselves are by nature, a lot of them are chronic. So it's not a see once, treat, 
take out the appendix and they go home. So that's why I'm very sorry that our Volvo clinics clog up. So do you think also it's to do with sort of socio-cultural things as well? With um, access and respect, yes. And, and the idea that a lot of women are postmenopausal and, uh, well, it must be the menopause and I have to put up with it and all that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. Yes, there's a lot of very stoic suffering women out oh, there. There yes. certainly are. Mm. And I guess one other thing too is like who owns the vulva, you could ask. Is it the dermatologist? Is it the general practitioner? Is it the gynaecologist? Is it the... Who does it? Because mm, it's an area, area of the body rather than a system and medicine that's is right. taught as a system. Yeah, that's, exactly. right, that's true. That's, yeah. a, that's a really valid yeah, point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Maybe that's yeah. why we all feel that we need to and listen to, to you tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think mm, it's really, this, this whole webinar is really crucial for getting people feeling more confident mm. about taking their part in the vulva, that not everybody has to wait for 18 months yeah. for a vulval clinic appointment. Would that that's, be right? Yes. That's, our, that's yeah. our purpose yeah. tonight. Yeah. We'll yeah. be yeah. delighted if that happens. Yes. Yes. yes, absolutely. So I'm passing over to Tanya to Thank take you. us through an anatomy refresher. Thank you very much. Now, so initially this is hopefully something that you all recognise as being a schematic of the vulva. And the things that you really need to be aware of is that the vulva has multiple functions as we've discussed and it's an area where the urinary tract and the gastrointestinal tract in the form of the anus as well as the reproductive tract with the vaginal opening indicated there in green they all meet and they all meet within folds and in addition to that there's a fabulous blood supply and in addition to that there is a fabulous nerve supply because Unlike any other area of the body, this area that we call the vulva that extends from the mons pubis at the top of the slide all the way down past the anus into the natal cleft, it is a heterogeneous area where, as we've said, no one specialty owns it. And so you've got all of the women's changes throughout their lives that they go through will rapidly affect different aspects of their vulva, how much hair they grow, what do they then remove their hair with, what is their cultural background will determine how they do it and whether or not they do it at all. So too will media. And then when they're pregnant, there are other expectations as to what they do and they might perhaps for the first time look at their vulva. And then also later on after menopause, things change again. And one of the things to note when you have a look at this particular drawing is that there are three different coloured sections in there in addition to what is labelled. Now, they each represent a different area of the embryo. The yellow represents what is derived from the ectodermal layer, the pink, the, meso the um, endoderm, and the mesoderm, which gives rise to the vagina. So what you have here is all three areas of the, of the embryo meeting. You have three different systems meeting. You have multiple tissue types all coming together. And so in essence, what happens here in addition, they all function differently from each other and they all function as an overlap when it comes to reproduction. And this is important because the normal function isn't solitary. Embryology determines whether or not um, a particular area is going to respond to estrogen or progesterone or perhaps to no particular hormone. And then what you're going to also have is the antigen responsiveness is different. Therefore, the infections that you may get or what may be normal to see colonizing a vagina in a woman in her reproductive years will not be the same as what it will be in a young girl before puberty. And so you also have the potential for contamination quite easily from urine that may leak or from faeces that may leak. And these things may complicate the dermatosis that we're going to be talking about later. And as a consequence of that, we have to consider how much of it is perhaps the primary underlying skin disorder and how much is actually um, what's happening in this area afterwards. So I'm just going to move on from that to the innovation of the vulva. And what you'll notice here, hopefully, is that there are all these different colours 
and you will be able to read these slides at your leisure after this webinar. Each colour represents a different lumbosacral root of innovation. There is no one colour over the entire vulva and inner thigh. So we don't have any single nerve that anatomically corresponds to any particular anatomical structure. And that's important in assessing symptoms of itch and pain and in assessing a patient who may have a vulval pain syndrome, which we'll be going into in one of the case studies a bit later. Similarly, with the blood supply, as you would expect, it's very complicated in the sense that there's a lot of blood supply because it has a lot of functions that it needs to do, not the least of which is its sexual function for pleasure and supply and to make sure tissue is healthy and to enable orgasm to occur, to enable delivery to occur and healing to occur afterwards. And so the, from the biopsy perspective, the beautiful thing is that there is no major blood vessel you're likely to hit when you're doing a skin biopsy for the diagnosis of a dermatosis in this region. Lymphatics, as we would all know, follow the lines of the venous circulation and these follow the lines of the blood circulation in the arteries that were, are outlined in the previous slide. Tanya, can I just get you to mention the photos before you get to uh, I can mention that. Thank you. That, Thank you. Uh, can I just interrupt and say yes. that we have many uh, photos of uh, vulvas and for some people that may be somewhat confronting. So yeah. please accept that we need to show you these photos as part of your learning. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So this is actually a schematic of the clitoris. And as you can see, and you really only see the tip of the clitoris when you are examining. And very similar to our male counterparts, we have the glands, we have the shaft, then we have the actual underlying erectile tissue, which extends back and behind the pubic rami. And then the question is, okay, fine. So we know all of that and none of it is really that vital to taking a skin biopsy if we see a lesion or if we see uh, a patient with a dermatosis. But it is important to, for us to be able to know these things, to be able to understand some of the functions in normality and in health, and the, know that these are different at different times in a woman's life. So what is normal for a prepubertal young girl is not necessarily what's normal for a woman who's just had a baby or for a postmenopausal lady. And if you aren't sensitive to the age of the patient, the changes that are occurring in the anatomy as a part of normal, then your patients will be able to get confused. You may not be able to reassure them adequately that this is normal for you at this particular time in your life. It leads to the patient saying, well, Am I normal? And you, as a clinician, saying, well, is this normal? And those are two very important questions that will be underlined a little bit further in the presentations that will follow. So we're moving on now to those pictures. And here is in real life, in terms of an actual patient photograph, the different structures that you will see and look out for when examining the vulva. And what you have starting anterior up the top, closest to the pubic bone, you have the clitoris and its associated structures, the shaft, the glands, the prepuce, then going down into the urinary system, you've got the urethral meatus, and further down, heart's line. And heart's line is actually not a genuine line that you can see, although sometimes you may be able to. But what it actually represents is where the vulvar vestibule finishes and the inner aspect of the inner labia minora begin. We used to put acetic acid on the vulva in order to be able to highlight this. We don't do that now because A, we realise that it doesn't show us anything useful. And secondly, it can actually sting quite badly if you do that. So you need to be aware that it's there. You need to be aware that it's a, a junction point of tissue type. 
and then you've got the little pits that you can see and those pits represent the openings of the vestibular glands. We hopefully are all aware of the Bartholin's gland ducts that tend to be more posterior and at about the five o'clock and seven o'clock sites. But there are also multiple minor vestibular glands that are responsible for some of the lubrication that occurs there. And those minor vestibular glands can become very inflamed and in that situation give, cause, give rise, I beg your pardon, to pain. The skein stuck. Can I interrupt? Sure. Sorry. Go right ahead. So can you tell us the difference between skeins and vestibular glands, mm -hmm. please? Excuse me. The Bartholin's glands, skeins glands are types of vestibular glands. The skeins glands specifically refer to the ones on either side of the urethra mm -hmm. and the Bartholin's to the Bartholin's gland ducts. And they are all located with their ducts opening onto the vestibule. So most of them are unnamed and they can vary in their position. Does, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. Okay. Thank you. So this is on a superimposed schematic on the actual photograph. Now right in the centre you can see the vaginal opening and the urethral meatus and then on the pale blue line that the vestibule is actually outlined and hopefully you can see that all of those glandular openings fall within that area and as you go further out you can actually see that the different tissue with the four dye spots on the inner aspect of the labia minora becomes present. So looking at it in reality, in the left picture you can see the heart lines quite clearly in this particular patient and the tissue to the vaginal side is more smooth and to the left hand side on the photo, I'm sorry I hope I've got that orientated correctly, is drier and the difference between those two tissue types is that the keratinization Too occurs nice. outside but not on the inside. Thank you. And the vestibular glands that we were just talking about can be present in multiple other places. They're not confined to the ones that I just mentioned. This is an example of vestibular pap papillomatosis. It's a variant of normal and what you see are all these tiny little projections right over the vulval vestibule. These aren't warts. Warts tend to be larger, more opaque and more clustered. They don't have this nice uniform pink appearance throughout the vulva vestibule. The cobblestone appearance that we as dermatologists refer to refers to a rough looking uneven uh, mucosal tissue and you can see there on the left and on the photograph on the right that it has a little bit of that appearance as though it looked like there was cobblestone paving there and what's actually causing those lumps and bumps are the normal apocrine or um, androgen sensitive oil secreting glands. You'll see this particular variant of normal more commonly in women as they get older and their little angiokeratomas which in essence a little blowout of a vein meeting an artery within the upper dermis and there's a little area of thickening of the skin over the top. They are quite benign but sometimes they can look quite dark and if a patient doesn't look at herself often or sometimes looks and you'll see perhaps just one or two in that setting they can be quite worrying as a potential for a true pigmented lesion. And this is another example of normal. This is a normal lady and what she's got is a split at what we call six o'clock. If you looked at the face of the clock as equal in the face of the vulva, the only thing that's happened here is that she's had sex the night before and as a consequence of that, there's just a little bit of shearing. Another example of normal. And again, more examples of normal. And you'll be able to look at these comfortably yourself when you review the webinar. Or normal. Normal for age. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anya.
People did ask for lots of photos, and I think that's the problem about not seeing enough vulvas to feel yep. comfortable mm. with the with mm. the normal. So I think mm. it's really valuable for those of you who are not used to um, seeing vulvas in your everyday work. Um, you know, it might take a little bit of getting used to, but for the um, people who are who are needing to know what they're seeing when they're seeing a vulva, I think this is really crucial. Um, we're going to have a poll, um, and we just want to ask you to join in and um, and tell us if a new if a female patient comes to see you um, with a vulvo vaginal itch, do you examine her? So this is there's no right answer here. We just love you to um, participate in the poll um, and tell us whether that would be something you do. Maybe if after this, it will be something that you do if you're not doing it already, um, but we'd really love you to tell us. So we're getting some results coming in. And we've got, I think we can share that results so that you can see it. Um, we're getting a lot of always, which is fantastic. That's what we love to yes. see, isn't it, doctors? Absolutely. Um, mm. That people are always examining the vulva when a patient comes in with that. And only 5% of people are saying they never examine the vulva. And maybe that will move after this with these clinicians, that we'll actually get people um, looking at their vulva all the time because otherwise they will not find what's, what's coming up or what's, mm. what the person's presenting with. So now we're going to move on to um, Dr. Cathy Cook. Um, who's going to talk to us about how and examination, basically, aren't you? Yes. So this is the um, fabulous wall of vagina that is found in Mona in Hobart. If you ever get the chance to see it, I recommend it. When do we examine? Well, we examine with symptoms and the vulval symptoms can vary greatly. Some people will come in and say, oh, I've got the thrush. Well, what does that mean? Have you got itch? Have you got burning? Have you got dysuria, dryness, pain? Um, so tease out what the actual symptoms are. In particularly in elderly women, incontinence is a very common problem, both of faeces and of urine. And um, associated with that is pad wear, though some people just like to wear a pad in case something happens. But you will never um, sort out a dermatosis if uh, that poor skin is sitting in urine and faeces all day. So we can examine with symptoms. We can also be opportunistic. Now with our fabulous um, improvements with um, HPV testing, with the um, cervical screening test now, we only will be examining our patients routinely every five years. So this is perhaps a bit of a lost opportunity and be very careful to may perhaps make more of the symptoms. Why do we examine? A lot of people come to see us who are normal and it's to reassure normality. Sometimes it's to diagnose an abnormality. Every opportunity is a chance to educate and empower these women. And alongside of that, we can allay fear and ignorance, which is widespread of the vulva. How do we examine? I'm sure you're all experts in this already, but we must examine with consent and respect, with kindness and compassion. It's a very confronting thing. Do it in a safe environment. If they require somebody to be with them, their daughter, their husband, that's fine, whatever they're comfortable doing. Offer a chaperone if you can. Good lighting is essential. Simple act of offering a sheet it gives people some dignity. And we always offer a mirror. We try to engage our patients to look at their own vulva. And um, again, this is an opportunity of education to take away fear. And particularly people who are using creams, we'll often use and say, show me exactly where you're putting your ointment. And uh, sometimes it doesn't correlate at all with what, what we've asked them to do. And so there's your problem. Also, always have your equipment set up. Do not put the speculum in and then decide you better go and find that, the uh, brush to do the pap smear with. So on examination, we note the anatomy and the skin. We know what is normal and abnormal. Common dermatoses will be um, covered a lot in this talk, such as lichen sclerosis. VIN may be present. And be mindful that there are general um, common skin conditions that you may see, such as warts, molluscum. And note anything like redness, swelling, tenderness, blisters, such as herpes may be the cause of their pain. 
No more variants, as uh, Tanya has given us a great talk already, are incredibly important. Know your normal variants. This will allay distress. It will avoid unnecessary interventions. You can be very positive in your body language. For example, you could say um, angiokeratoma, it's just a beauty spot, rather than it's an aberrant collection of blood vessels or something like that. Celebrate the individuality of the patients. So again, these are normal variants. Hymenal, prominent hymenal remnants, and as Tanya has already showed us, vulval papillomatosis. These are not warts. These are not cancers. These do not need treatment or any problem. And again, angiokeratoma, or as I might say to an elderly patient, just a little beauty spot, don't worry. Can you call them cherry hemangiomas? Are they the same thing? Because when you look in some of the dermatology books, that's what it's got. Uh, I th the only difference is that an angiokeratoma is supposed to have an extra thickened layer mm. of keratinin over oh, the top. I see. And so the pathology, yeah, scaling. and they can okay. have that scale. Mm. So okay. you're right, but it has a different name in that area just to uh, increase okay. the vocabulary. Well, I've learnt something. <laughs> Okay, so abnormal examinations. I have a very simple and very systematic approach. Is the anatomy normal? Is the skin normal? And uh, it gets me through every examination. <laughs> <laughs> so I look at the anatomy. Are there areas of resorption scarring? Is the introitus normal? Is the clitoral hood normal? And then looking at the skin, well, what colour is it? Is it normal? Is it red? Is it white? Is it... Um, darkened and is the texture normal is it thickened is it indurated so here's an example of a um, patient's vulva so let's look at the anatomy well the labia look quite normal to me the introitus looks normal and the labia look a normal color but down at the posterior fourchette there's a darkened area and it's thickened and this on biopsy was vin so that is not normal comment on the colour of the upper labia minora there. It is, seems to be quite pigmented. Yes, but that could be a variant with the uh, race of the woman. And it's quite common. It could be, A yes. common finding yes. in women. Yes, Thank yes. You. And that's um, not patchy, it's not particularly darkened, the skin doesn't look thickened, mm. and it's nicely symmetrical. So I would find those uh, reassuring figures. Yes. Would you agree, Tanya? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So the other thing about an examination is that when we're examining the vulval skin, we must examine the whole of the vulval area up into the mons and then posteriorly into the perianal area Two and minutes. into the natal cleft. So looking carefully at the, um, on the left you can see, it doesn't look too bad, there's a hint of a figure of eight distribution of pallor, but when you actively open the labia very gently and carefully, you can see there's resorption and whitening and other features that were suggestive of lichen sclerosis. Here's another um, example of lichen sclerosis. Are the labia normal? No. Well, in fact, I can't see that there are specific labia there, so we have resorption. Is the clitoral hood normal? No. It's again quite um, scarred over. Does the introitus look normal? No. Is the skin normal? Well, there's areas of pink, but there's also areas of white and crinkling. So this is another example of lichen sclerosis. I'll just briefly touch on when to take a vi vo vulval biopsy. It's not essential in every case, but the times that we would suggest it's necessary, anything that is suspicious, in particular thickened or ulcerated. If we want to get a diagnosis, if it's not clear, or sometimes in young people who will be faced with a lifetime of treatment and follow-up, it is important to say yes, they do, or no, they don't have lichen sclerosis. Anything that does not respond to treatment or is atypical requires a biopsy. Now I'd like to finish off with this rather horrific for, uh, slide. And on the left hand bottom side, every single one of you would have said that's not normal and would have seen what is a very nasty cancer. But now I ask you to be systematic and go round it. 
Are there labia there? No, there aren't. Is the um, clitoris apparent? No, it isn't. It's all absorbed away. Is the introitus normal? No, it's scarred. Is the skin normal? Well, actually, it's white and there's a thickening hyperkeratotic area at the posterior fourchette. Mm. So now I hope you would all be able to say, well, this is an obvious vulval cancer in a background of chronic lichen sclerosis. Thank you. Can I ask you, when you take a biopsy, if you were going to take a biopsy on the lady with the vulval cancer, mm. where would you actually cite your biopsy? Would you take it in the middle of the lesion? Would you take it across the normal skin and the lesion? Where would you take it? Do you want to comment? Yeah, maybe. Well, I've had the misfortune and the privilege of actually seeing something very similar to this. And whilst the diagnosis, as you say quite rightly, is clinically apparent because this lady was going to be referred on to a gynae-oncologist, I actually did take a wedge biopsy, so it wasn't a punch, it was a wedge incisional biopsy from the top down and I documented it photographically. And I also took um, a punch biopsy further down from that thickened hypertrophic area because there was actually some VIN there as well and another smaller wedge from the smaller lesion on her left. So there are actually multiple ones taken. But when you take a biopsy, say in someone you're wanting to say take an example of the, the lichen, the whitened yes. area, you'd try and take it across the normal and you wouldn't take it if just... You can. If you can. So Unfortunately, if you can, you, this you're trying lady, to get... you can't. Yeah, yes. okay. So thank this you. lady, when you're trying to take a wedge, yes. you would be taking it from the cancer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I have the clicker? Okay. Thanks very much to cover some of that, um, you know, really important part of um, examination and anatomy to to help everybody, guide everybody through. Um, we've got a, another poll coming um, and this time we're asking, and this follows up with Cathy's suggestion that um, there's opportunistic um, times to examine the vulva as well. So if you've got someone who's come in who's got um, continence issues or an eye comes in for an IUD or another sexual or reproductive health matter, are you examining her vulva at that time? So if you'd like to just answer that one um, quickly. So, so it looks like people have been very quick. It obviously went up before I knew. Um, it looks like it looks like we've got a bit of a mix. You can share those results um, now. So we've got often a normal as rating really highly there, which I think is fabulous. Yes. You know, some of these opportunistic times um, really make the most of those. And I think there's a lot of questions around dermatitis or um, um, irritation related to continence too. So that was a question that's come up a lot actually. Um, we probably won't go on with that now, but that might come up later in our questions. Um, we're going to go back to Tanya now and um, she's going to Thank you. Um, start our case study, which you hopefully have seen before tonight, as we did send them this afternoon. Thank you. So the first time that this that young Claire presented, she was only 42 years old and she had actually had itch for nearly five years beforehand. And she also was a little bit dry and a little bit chafed with intercourse. And she felt uncomfortable the next day. And she had used a little bit of a topical uh, antifungal preparation and one that was applied into the vagina that she purchased over the counter at the chemist. They gave us some mild short-lived improvement and even the oral fluconazole did the same but nothing that really substantially made uh, things much better for her. Or So the other history that's important in addition to that is that she did have an abnormal smear and had seen one in the past in her early 30s and that required uh, laser therapy and was adequately treated and followed up at the time. And we went through her hygiene review and there really wasn't very much to change except for the fact that when we really don't want ladies using soap and water. Water's fine. Soap by its very nature can unfortunately be a bit irritating, but it didn't seem to be of a great deal of validity in her 
Then we went on to have a look and this is following Kathy's rule, which is very useful. You can see there that the labia are not all present. And if you look at the space between or the interlabial sulcus between the labia minora and majora, it's not there for the bulk of the vulva. The clitoral hood is also stacked down. And essentially this area is all white. And importantly, apart from the bruising that's there, there's, there's no nasty bumps, there's no ulcers that shouldn't be there, there's no substantial discharge. So clinically, I thought that this lady had lichen sclerosis. And because of the substantial changes that were present, a biopsy was taken. And on this particular occasion, I just took it from an area that was um, most white. And I did, as I routinely do, did a low vaginal swab. Now the biopsy showed changes that were confirming the diagnosis clinically of lichen sclerosis, but nothing else. Um, uh, going on this and the in, there was no evidence of infection on the results of the swab. So I placed her onto the betamethasone dipropionate ointment initially asking her to do it twice a day for 10 weeks and then daily for 10 weeks and then three times a week just of an evening and I had a look at her again about 12 weeks later. Excuse me Tanya, yeah. would that be um, diprazone OV or just plain diprazone at that point? At that point I would usually use just plain diprazone. Okay. I find it convenient to have ladies be given more than one tube and mm -hmm. then they can have one tube in their handbag, in their bathroom and I also like to get them to have one on their bedside table Good. so if you're exhausted mm. and you lie down at the end of mm. the day you don't have to get up to put an ointment on. It's so practical. Yeah. Well I don't think I'd do that so I don't expect them to do that. <laughs> That's a fantastic point. <laughs> and it's ointment. And yes, it's ointment. always ointment. Yeah. You'll find some ladies just don't like the ointment. It's and a bit, bit, bit too gooey and they yeah. think it's a bit too greasy. Look, in that situation, you know that they're not going to use it all the time if they don't like the feel of it, and then you use the cream because that's better. You have to be adaptable. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yes. So, in terms of when you do a biopsy, just expanding a little bit further, these are the sorts of things that you need to consider, otherwise you might end up in a bloody mess, which is not pleasant for you or the mm. patient. And interestingly, now with so many people taking aspirin for a variety mm. of reasons, it is probably the single most um, bleeding, aggravating factor that we come across. Warfarin you prepare for, but aspirin, because it has a different mechanism of action, just unfortunately leads to a lot of bleeding. So you just check beforehand, and I like to do use a little bit of adrenaline in this situation. Mm. It just means the only thing is you have to wait a good 10 minutes. So I tend to inject the local and then go back after I've set up. Yeah. I've been caught out with fish oil. Yes. Fish oil. Yes, it does. It does cause bleeding and, mm -hmm. and yes. Turmeric. I heard on Radio National yesterday. <laughs> turmeric. Are. So a lot of people are taking turmeric. Yeah, they are. And, um, as an anti-inflammatory. Yes. I wasn't yeah, that's aware right. that it actually yes, caused the bleeding. That's what Radio National mm -hmm. told me yesterday mm -hmm. morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, and the other thing, of course, is that we've now got the new anticoagulants, which yes. is non-reversible, yes. which you can't reverse. That's mm. right. Yes. yes. So. Yes, we do we're, have to take that into consideration. Yeah. We're always needing to um, update our questions. And <laughs> the other thing to bear in mind also, because some of our ladies may be quite elderly, as Cathy was alluding to the difficulty in getting them to get undressed for an examination, mm -hmm. it's all very well to tell them to put on the ointment, but if they don't have the flexibility yep. to manage a tube with their hands or to put it in the right place, how much they use or if they're able to get it where you really want to may also change, plus their ability to look after themselves. Mm -hmm. So I would adapt what I ask them to do mm -hmm. to try and make it easier for them. Mm -hmm. And I do like to take photographs so that I can show my patients where the changes are, what they are, mm -hmm. and to then use that, you must always obtain consent. And obviously the ladies whose photographs I've been able to show you have given consent and that's why we're able to um, see their pictures today. So is this, is, is this a situation where you could actually take a photo of her vulva with their phone? Yes. So that they in fact mm. then have a record. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yes. And so you can then, when 
she comes back for follow-up, you can then say, well, look, yes, this is how it's progressed or... And that facilitates yes. shared care too with Absolutely. the general practitioner. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they, and everybody has a good visual record. Mm -hmm. And some, some of my ladies will bring in a USB port mm -hmm. and some will bring in their, their, a camera in addition to their phone. All but right. I th I, you know, it's their vulva and it's important that they understand what's going mm -hmm. on. I found that the ease of photography that's now available has mm -hmm. been a great aid to mm. how we manage our mm. consultations. Interesting. So in general, for this sort of patient, I would find a punch biopsy for millimetres perfectly adequate. And I do tend to put in a stitch. A lot of people do not. Uh, it's really, I like people when they're practising or learning what they do to do what they're comfortable with. I mean, we have a gynaecologist at Jean Hales who uses um, cervical biopsy forceps because that's an instrument she's very comfortable with and she's able to get a really good biopsy doing that. That's fine. I prefer to use punches. So before I see a lady again, before I saw Claire again, I made sure that as she was going home and she was young enough and mobile enough to look after herself. Well, she didn't have any specific treatment, but I did give her instructions on how to use salt bathing to the area as a soothing agent, and also um, gave her a little bit of information as to where she might be able to go onto the internet to find information regarding lichen sclerosis. I find it's much easier if I introduce that because mm. patients will go home and they'll look it up and they need to be warned that mm. the worst cases are the first thing that they're going to see and that's really not what you want to be having them look at because they'll get frightened mm. and so if you preempt anything that comes up in your discussion and you preempt them and you're showing them that you're not scared of the internet and you're showing them how they can use the internet for their good and I think that's really important and and as you're aware we have, uh, Jean Hales has a vulval booklet, mm -hmm. which includes in that all the aspects of vulval hygiene or vulval care. Yep. And uh, we have separate little booklets, but it is on, available on the website. Yep. Thank you. So then what happened with Claire is that um, she w we continued follow up very comfortably and she was managing on three times a week really well. and. She got a new job, she started working in the city and I'm in regional Victoria so that meant a little bit more work uh, related travel for her and as I think we can all relate to when you're really busy you tend to put yourself a little bit further down the um, list of priorities as to what to do and she was quite comfortable knowing that she had a diagnosis and that she had an ointment and when she put it on she got relief of her itch. Unfortunately, she also had more problems with her knee and that was actually limiting what she was doing. So what she did was to go and have that checked out and was ready to go and have surgery and thought, just in case I'm not going to be able to put my ointment on while I'm recovering, I better make sure everything's okay. She said, yeah, I know I should have been here a bit earlier, but it's been really responding well to the ointment. And so this time when I saw her, unfortunately, things had actually got a bit worse. The extent of her lichen sclerosis had increased and she was um, unfortunately getting involvement all the way, whoops, sorry. She was getting it perianally and over the perineum, whereas that was not present before. And she had at the front, and I'm sorry, I don't have that particular photo, but she had a very, a couple of, small plaques anteriorly over the vulva where they had fused. So instead of being white and crinkly or white and smooth, they looked as though there were a couple of areas where something had been stuck on. And as Kathy's plaque of pigmented vin was shown at the posterior fourchette, we, I, I was suspicious that it might indicate that some vin had occurred. So another biopsy was taken and Unfortunately, that was confirmed as having been. I think it's in interesting and important to note that she had had sin in the past. And thank you. Certainly women who have had uh, HPV related disease in the past and do develop lichen sclerosis are at a great risk of developing VIN and possibly invasive cancer and follow-up is important to make sure that if that happens, the changes are picked sooner. 
So I think I've touched on some of the things that you need. The most important thing is you need to actually let your patient know why you're doing what you're doing and what you can expect. So, Could I just yeah. ask a little question? Um, in regard to the likelihood of development for um, a vein or a mm. cancer, is there any evidence that um, a, a treatment in a preventative way makes a difference? Like this woman mm. um, stopped mm. her regular treatment and maybe more on a PRN basis. Yep. I think it, at the moment, the evidence that we've got from that study that Gail Fisher mm. did in Sydney certainly is starting to suggest what we suspect and that is that we can make a difference to stop progression of the disease and to stop the development of VIN mm. by treating and treating maintenance as well as treating the symptoms. It's good news, isn't it? It is wonderful mm. news. Mm. And for instance, is that article you speak of is actually in the resource folder, so yes. people can download that. Yes. Yep. And uh, we can anticipate that there'll be even more work done as to how we yep. do that best. But that's the first time that's actually been shown yeah. in addition to spoken yeah, about. Which is great. Yes. So long term, yes, unfortunately, this patient has, as we have suspected, a lifelong condition. Even if she's not itchy, the likelihood that she's going to continue to have lichen sclerosis and have progression of her lichen sclerosis is there. So it's important that we let her understand that that is in fact the case and that even if she's not feeling anything, she's going to have to use the cream as a maintenance level long term. And as far as we know, long term at this point in time means for life. And the reason that we do that is so that we don't get the further worsening and more anatomical losses we can see here where all structures anterior to the vaginal introitus have been lost. And here again, this is another patient. We have even more extensive loss of the labia minora with thickening of the, around the vaginal introitus. And that's a very uncomfortable uh, patient who actually came with pain with intercourse rather than itch as her dominant symptom. And this lovely lady who came with a bit of itch and her um, daughter-in-law and she had obvious vitiligo, which is an increased association with lichen sclerosis. But she was sent to me urgently by her doctor because she had an episode of frank bleeding. And when you had a look, you can see in the photograph on your right on, that unfortunately that is a very large invasive squamous cell carcinoma over the clitoris. And because of her age and multiple morbidities, radiotherapy was used. So what you need to do and what you can expect is she'll get better and she'll get better with respect to itch first. Her anatomy will stay altered, so it's important that therapy continues. Thank you. Can I ask you a question about when, you, when a doctor's been looking at the vulva and checking the vulva and you see all this whitened skin, mm -hmm and yet they've got absolutely no symptoms. Mm -hmm. How do you explain to someone that they should actually treat that skin condition, which mm -hmm. looks like lichen sclerosis, mm -hmm. because if it's got loss of architecture, mm -hmm. loss of the clitoral hood, loss of the labia minora, mm -hmm. how do you explain and how do you get women to actually use their th their yeah. diprosone or whatever steroid you're going to use? And they manage. say, I don't yeah. have any, I don't have yeah. any symptoms. Mm. I think that, well, I don't think that there's a one answer fits everybody in yeah. that situation. It does depend on patient age and, and why you were able to make the diagnosis in the first place, because there's a reason you're looking at her vulva. Yeah. And it may be that when you actually ask if they've been itchy or a bit uncomfortable or had any rawness, that something might become apparent. Because about four to five percent of women will not be itchy. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I think that's of value is showing her a photograph. Yes, and actually, yes, actually, and show her what's show her different. what it's different. Yes, I think that's a very good mm. idea because it's it? easy yes. today to get onto the yes. internet and see photos of yes. what should be there. Mm. Yes, and then say that you know these are the changes that have happened, but and we can't change it. But what it means for the future for you mm. can be quite nasty. Mm. Great. And the fact that this has happened without yeah. you being aware and of it makes it yes, exactly. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. So another um, 
sort of little hurdle mm -hmm. sometimes I face is I um, you've got the diagnosis, the patient is on board, and then when they go to the oh, chemist, the chemist. Oh, yes. um, <laughs> oh. they're told not to use such strong steroids, it's very yes. dangerous for them, yes. and then they come back and they've hardly used any, and it's quite useful to ask how many tubes they've used, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. How long does it yes. last? How yes. long does yes. last a year, yes. you're worried? Because yes. if a 15 gram tube is still going six months later, they're probably not mm. using it. Yeah. So Certainly, it's yeah. Worth so, yeah, that's We've got right. quite a few pharmacists who've registered for tonight, so yeah. Right. Hopefully this is a great mm, opportunity for yeah. them to yeah, gain yeah. some knowledge too mm. around because that. I think it's difficult for the pharmacist because they do have to say those mm, things and it's course. quite appropriate to say those things. Mm. However, they're not because they're not going to know why. Mm. So I don't know whether we need to have more dialogue and, and they may come to recognise prescriptions mm. from you maybe for those sorts of things mm. and just check has your doctor explained how to use this yeah. and, and maybe as a clinician it. you need to preempt yes. that right. what's going to happen and is that is a that useful conversation yeah. to have with your patients we've, we've beforehand talked about, we've talked about this a lot in the clinics because we work together always mm. as a team and I think we've generally come to the conclusion a little bit of over treatment is better than a little bit of under treatment yes. when yes. you're risking um, both scarring and yep. um, risk for an SC so steroid telangiectasia, yes, it does occur. Significant thinning, well, lichen sclerosis itself can cause some thinning, mm. but but it's better to be on mm. top of it and then mm. redirect exactly where yeah. the, um, and then the woman's treatment is yes. feeling confused given. Confused by the exactly. Absolutely. points exactly. of view, and yet you want them to use mm. that yes. ointment for the rest of their yes. life. Yes, yes. absolutely. And I think therein too. If you, one of the things that you check for when you re-examine is not only control of the disease, but to make sure that they're not getting signs of having overused yes, cortisone. Exactly. So used appropriately, yes, it's fantastic. Right. And that's what we always say, a place. smear. Yes. Yeah, and then that's where, the, that's where the mirror is very good. Yeah, yes, indeed. And usually at night, if it's a single mm. dose yes. per yeah. day. If you Just before they about. go to sleep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Could you just advance the slide? Because I think we have another poll, but we're going to be really do. quick because we're running a little behind time. Um, our next poll, Karen. and we're sort of ahead. This poll's Thank a you. bit ahead of uh, of where we're up to. But um, it's just a question around candida infection, and is it likely to occur in a woman post menopause who's not using HRT? Okay. So, answer our poll, and then we'll get moving with Karen and the next case study. People are thinking candida. Sorry, I've said it wrong. I've said it wrongly. <laughs> well, it's a bit like tomato and tomato. Yes. Mm. My apologies. <laughs> I was told right. earlier, and Depends I still got it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. Yeah. Bad, bad um, all of the time. So oh, yeah. this is fabulous. Seventy-three percent of our audience are saying no, it doesn't. Excellent. So that's great. We love Excellent. that. We do. Um, you must be speaking to the converted. Yeah, I think so. maybe. That's Twelve percent of people don't know. Um, Twenty-one percent say maybe. Twenty-two percent say. Yes, it can. So, well, it can. I mean, yeah, you do have to remember right. things like diabetes, and mm, certainly yeah. in um, mm, our sexual health nice. service and in men, you know, balanitis in a middle aged man, commonest reason, diabetes. early diabetes. diabetes. Yes. yes. Um, yes. So we did, and of course, immunosuppressants and yes. things yes. like that. But yes, yes hormonally based, mm. no, not alone. But it is mm, a good thing to remember, isn't it? For yes. People? yes. I yes. think so. Mm. Now, Karen, we're going to move on to yes. you. Okay, let's go. And our second case study. Yes. Okay, so um, this is Amal who came to our service. She was a 26 year old woman um, referred by a sexual counsellor. If we look down the slide a little bit, um, she had self referred herself to a sexual counsellor. And the reason for that was um, probably shyness. Um, she Googled her symptoms and thought it was a a problem of sexual function. She described seven months of vulvo vaginal pain with a feeling of something being blocked at all attempts at intercourse. She'd been married for seven months. She'd had no prior partner. Um, she was very well educated. She was from outside Australia and had no previous self treatments or as we said, medical consultation. So from her history at this point, um, from what she gave us, um, the pain duration actually is uncertain. She certainly describes pain as sex, but without previous um, self-touch such as masturbation, no previous tampon use, there never being a previous partner, we really don't know how long she's had provoked pain, that is provoked by touch. She didn't describe any spontaneous pain. 
The only thing she offered spontaneously in her history was that um, there was leucorrhea. She actually used that word, mm -hmm. so a white discharge, but didn't give any indication of symptoms associated with that. I mentioned there there are no pain complicating features, and by this I mean we can get onto that later. Um, it's well described in one of our articles, but any hint that there might be um, previous pain sensitivity, such as uh, bladder irritability or childhood bladder fussiness, other things you might think about it, um, irritable bladder, uh, migraine, fibromyalgia, that sort of thing. There's also no depression, anxiety, or specific trauma history for this woman. Now the initial consultation um, was by um, a young colleague and she went pretty much to a targeted pain history which is pretty accurate. It um, really did support the diagnosis of a provoked uh, vestibulodynia and given the nature of the referral. But we didn't have an idea of associated or trigger factors and by the time we were examining it was pretty obvious she had more than pain sensitivity. Um, direct questioning once we examined the vulva revealed that she'd actually had seven months of generalised vulval itching and scratching. So this is why I highlight this is a pitfall of not taking a thorough history initially. So it's almost like don't ask, don't tell. So we need to directly ask people these things because people are embarrassed. Um, they don't tell you they're scratching. Scratching is a little taboo in our society. Each scratch, what, how they're washing, how often are they rubbing face cloths, toilet paper, how often, with what, continence, taboo, you must ask about continence, pads and liners, that can be from habit, that can be from need, um, skin generally doesn't like these things every day. Sexual skin discomfort, does skin split during sex, is it comfortable, is there burning afterwards and so on. What's the degree of arousal and ability to orgasm? Now, we need to signpost all these questions. Medical students know exactly what signposting means, but we were not brought up with that term. So we need to explain why we're asking these questions in order not to be too confronting. But the tampon question is really useful because it, it tells us that she's comfortable to touch her vulva and the comfort level of inserting anything. Same with self-touch, comfortable, yes, no, orgasm, no, never orgasm, just, you know, and so on. And later in the um, consultation, and it might not be this consultation, it might be a subsequent consultation, we talk about attitudes to sexual relationships, atti attitudes to a self, relationships, and trauma. Now, trauma doesn't have to be overt. It doesn't have to be physical trauma. It doesn't have to be sexual trauma, but it can be fear of not being safe especially not safe as a child or any adult at home. More questions to ask. What and where on the vulva are the symptoms? Women do not use the word vulva. I suggest we use a drawing. Um, where are we talking? They usually say the problem is vaginal. So itch, we think of dermatitis or candida, or is it another symptom, burning or something else, which makes us think more towards a sensitivity or pain problem. Um, anything acute, um, infection or dermatitis can burn, we must remember that. But we're thinking of, um, in the first instance, an abnormal examination to follow um, a story of itch or an no abnormal skin if the symptom is isolated to burning in the absence of an acute uh, dermatosis or infection. Um, or other symptoms. So normal examination, expected or abnormal skin. So spontaneous symptoms or provoked by touch or both will help us distinguish um, categories of vulvodynia. Is there discharge, associated urinary symptoms or a history of um, ATP or other dermatitis that can contribute to symptoms? Whether it's a long history or a sudden history, and again, we're a little bit stymied in this woman regarding her pain because if we're thinking about um, Provoked touch, we have no story of provoked touch until her marriage. Now, are there times with no symptoms despite the same triggers? Um, what has been the effect of prescribed or self-prescribed medications? Often people say nothing helps, but what they mean is the medication helps for a while and then there's relapse. We should ask about has there ever been previous swabs or an MSU taken? Often people come with a, a dysuria, but 
um, MSUs either have or haven't been taken and it's ne never proven to be uh, a UTI. We have to consider STI or a form of uh, vulvodynia with a urethral sensitivity. So for this woman, there was little obvious to initial in vulval inspection and we'll get to that slide in a moment. She was initially too painful to touch as she was very frightened. Uh, and these, um, the fear needs to be addressed and we need to take time. Very careful vulvar exposure actually revealed an extensive dermatitis and therefore triggered the question of have you been itchy? Uh, we saw skin fissures and erosions. In our clinic we have microscopy available and we could see pseudohyphae. Um, and, but at this stage uh, we cannot assess the degree of pain sensitivity or vulvodynia at that time. So initial examination doesn't show very much. It showed a little bit of redness but apart from a white discharge on this slide I would say there's not much to see. Uh, difficult to assess the labial size but in fact her labia were fairly normal but small for her um, size. Now with more extensive, this active examination that Cathy and Tanya has, have already talked about, we can see more skin changes. Unfortunately, without a pointer, but in the upper lateral area, the skin actually is finely crinkled. And we wondered, could this be an element of lichen sclerosis? But I think you can't even judge that at this point. Is there a little bit of fusion in the interlabial sulci? Mm, hard to say, but there is some edema in the fusion lines. What's a little bit difficult to see, and I'll show you on the next slide, um, again, this is all very red and all very flesh coloured and in a dark skinned woman you can see it's actually very red. So this is, these photos are taken in the same consultation. Lower down, I'm sorry again I don't have a pointer, but there actually is a longitudinal ulcer. Um, on the slides left, um, in the lower half of the labia minor in the sulcus. On the opposite side there's actually a very fine longitudinal fissure. There are small satellite lesions and the white discharge that you can see. Uh, we couldn't expose the vestibule very well because she was so tender. But we see pseudohyphae, it confirms um, acute candida. So our initial management, well, do we treat this as acute or chronic candida or recurrent if you like? Do we add a topical steroid? What potency, what vehicle? We give her general skin care and advise no touch that's uh, painful because that will trigger more pain sensitivity. This is the regimen we gave her and we certainly educated her about the in interplay of skin inflammation triggering chronic pain. This is her three weeks later, unrecognisably different. Her tenderness had um, reduced markedly. Initially she rated it 8 out of 10 with a cotton tip touch and now she rated it 2 out of 10. We can see a prominent hymenal band. We still weren't so certain whether it was vulvodynia, but we was provoked vulvodynia, but we were suspicious. We, treat, we continued with the um, suppression. We tapered the topical steroid, uh, and, which was an ointment, mid-potency, and we reviewed her for assessment of the hymenal band. We wanted to include the partner, and we made a multidisciplinary referral, and very important to continue with the counsellor for the impact of the pain. So at one month review, again, she was very good. There was no attempted sexual touch at that point, And we made a physiotherapy re um, referral. And at this point, I'll say, remember placebo. Concepts of placebo have greatly changed in the last decade. It is not a concept of deception. It is highly effective, especially with pain, but in other conditions, uh, ex an expectation of improvement is crucial and hopefulness and positivity from the practitioner is crucial. And there needs to be a ritual of therapeutic behavior change, which might be uh, how we do things, the physiotherapy or medication. Openly used placebo with patients informed of placebo still works. Now, you can see, um, she, at this point, at two months, she hadn't seen the physiotherapist. The counsellor had been organised. She had many, many fears about sex and childbirth, and we still need to know the position um, and the awareness of the partner. Some new brief sentences we can say to people, it might hurt, but it does not equal harm to your body, harm to your tissues. It may be sore, but you are safe. Your tissues are safe. 
accurate knowledge and good relationships with practitioners and partner reduce fear and helplessness. Catastrophization in the chronic pain literature means the person is fearful, feels helpless and has lost her control. Education helps this greatly. Finally, is this complicated or uncomplicated? I'll leave you with this slide. It is um, discussed in one of our um, articles that we'll refer to, but basically there are subtypes of uh, vulvodynia. The longer duration of pain and the more severe the pain, the more likely it is to be complicated. Other different um, difficult to treat conditions make it more complicated and a high degree of central sensitization, which again you'll be familiar with in the chronic pain literature, makes it harder to treat. We've got a little bit, I think, that's self-evident for difficult candidiasis, but again, ongoing untreated candida is the commonest trigger for localised provoked vulvodynia. We need to take it seriously. Biopsy can show, um, we can see pseudohyphae in the keratin layers. That um, uh, vaginal swab was negative and the swab from, this is in another patient, the swab from the vulva from the abnormal area was also negative. Equally, you can have vulval microscopy and culture positive and vaginal negative, so swab abnormal sites. And these are two final slides to show variations in um, candidiasis. It looks nasty, doesn't it? Mm. I've just had a question come in about pain. Um, mm. So whether it's re relating to vulvodynia, I'm not sure. She just says, the GP says, several physio colleagues have recently requested I write scripts for topical compounded products for vulval pain. In particular, I have seen requests for combination NDEP, baclofen yes. and clonidine. Mm. Can you please comment on the evidence behind the combo of multiple topical products? Look, this is really difficult because um, there's no strong evidence for any treatment. The, um, the best probable uh, treatment evidence is for physiotherapy directed at um, pelvic floor overactivity. Um, so the women who have predominant pelvic floor overactivity um, without these other complicating factors are in a way the luckiest, but they're most amenable to treatment. To say that the other ones do or don't work is very difficult because the evidence is poor. Not that, that it doesn't work, but the design of the studies is generally, one study tends to be very different to another study. Um, this is the same in generalised chronic pain settings, not just vulval, but especially vulval. And the numbers tend to be small in these studies. So you might get a, a, a 20 to 30 to 40% effectiveness, but that's actually not very different to placebo. Um, and again, we need to maximise placebo, utilise placebo, and don't denigrate a treatment to say, well, it's only placebo. Um, we would say do what works. Do the most simple and least expensive first, the most accessible. And um, for instance, I asked you about Diprazone OV. Yeah. That's expensive, but yeah. Diprazone ointment is on um, if for someone on a healthcare card. So yes. we tailor things to the practical side of things. Yeah. I wouldn't go... Um, saying, well, this one, you know, really will work. It's got the most up to date. It's the latest. It's this. It may or may not. One of the big advantages to using something topically, and that might be um, a topical local anaesthetic, is that the woman is engaged with her vulva, mm. touching, massaging, exploring her muscles, and by this stage working with a physiotherapist who is hands-on. In all chronic pain um, conditions, there is more evidence for the effectiveness of hands-on physiotherapy than machine-related uh, physiotherapy. And these requests were coming from physios too, yes. so that's interesting. Yeah. They're yes. obviously looking for something yes. in addition yes. to the treatment that I they are offering. I wouldn't say there's a magic bullet. Yeah. yeah. No, okay. There isn't. Can you, Thank you, Karen. Can, yes. Sorry. Sorry. Can you just talk about the various types and why there is a classification of types of vulvodynia? I think so. I think for a long time we were just trying to um, come to grips ourselves with the condition of vulvodynia. Was it spontaneous? You know, was it really harder to treat primary, which is, you know, from first touch or um, secondary where there's been comfortable touch for a long time? And probably the answer to that is it's not much different. It's more about the subtypes. Um, again, in our article that we published in 2017, which um, is referenced in um, your notes, and you'll be able to access that reference, uh, we talk about, and if you don't mind, I'll just go through so I don't forget, uh, the things that are less complicated. So short duration, milder pain sensitivity. 
No, or maybe one other chronic pain condition such as migraine, irritable bowel, irritable bladder, uh, temporomandibular joint pain. Little or no depression or, or anxiety or else readily treatable with good social supports. No trauma history. PTSD is a big factor and under-recognised in young women mm. and older women. People in general, we're starting to be aware of that in the literature. Um, well-controlled candidiasis makes it more easy to treat and so on. Someone who's sleeping well makes it uncomplicated. Really mm. chronically poor sleep brings it into the complicated. Um, now a predominantly overactive pelvic floor as the predominant finding, that's good. We mm. can work with that really well. We love the physiotherapists. Um, physiotherapists really are the key to this and the counsellors about the impact of the pain and the time that any practitioner takes. So we can look at broad subtypes. So the simple uncomplicated tend to be the, as I said, the overactive pelvic floor and the predominantly peripheral inflammatory mechanisms. That will be um, a, a candidiasis that's easy to control, a, a dermatosis that's easy to control. The t ones that tend to be complicated are where there's significant psychosocial and emotional factors. We talked about pre-existing anxiety without trauma even. Anxiety, depression is overrepresented in vulvodynia, especially anxiety. Um, and those with painful comorbidities. So we call that coexistent or other uh, chronic pain conditions. Um, so, so what about local and so the lo what are these different types? Well, the local ones tend to be the things that irritate the vulva. And that's why I said... Um, so that could be chronic candida. Absolutely. And that's why yeah, we say I'm when you're giving antibiotics... Anticipate that there's a vulnerability to candidiasis for a lot of reasons, especially the gut microbiome needs to have its healthy bacteria and inclu including vaginal lactobacilli to maintain that balance between commensal uh, candidiasis and the hyphal form, which is more invasive. Mm, thank so you. So very, very delicate balance. Thanks, Karen. Did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I think that Karen has given an excellent uh, classification. It was a, compl a complicated and not so complicated with in terms of the classification for example as the ISSVD has brought out that is trying to deal with the problem of vulvar pain so that it separates off vulvar pain with an obvious cause such as your chronic candidiasis yes. so that those are not considered to have true vulvodynia. Vulvodynia is where you have a woman who has pain that persists and there is no obvious cause for it. And that's where the generalised, localised, provoked, non-provoked comes. Mm. And those classifications are done in the hope that in research and in clinical practice we'll start to use the same language mm. so that then when we read a study, as Karen mm. alluded to before, the same language the is used. and yeah, we can methodologies. Exactly. Similar. So and we can, can compare, compare apples with apples, and as we say. it's so complicated because the, um, given the ISSVD and then mm. what's true vulvodynia, what's not, mm. it's... I mean, in front of you, you have a woman with the symptom. Yeah. And so it's vulvodynia. And we've gone through all this and we've decided it's vulvodynia. And it does seem to be that the vestibule has a very particular immunological function and sensitivity yes. Yes. to candida. So your trigger, and this is in all chronic pain, there was something that triggered it. It happened. Mm. Genetic factors are very mm. strong. There's, so these other comorbidities have strong genetic factors. Mm. Um, it's interesting, oestrogen candida, it, it, Yes, oestrogen um, with its increased glycogen and um, uh, glucose promotes candida, but equally oestrogen promotes antimicrobial activity a, of the yeah. epithelial cells. Yes. So there's an incredible balance. I mean, yes. I, think, I think our knowledge of candida is absolutely exploding at the moment. Absolutely. The other thing... Sorry, I was just I going to say. Yes, finish because is we're running out of time. Estrogen also is a neuromodulator. Absolutely. Yes. And so pain will be different at different times of the cycle. Mm. I Excellent. think we can gather that um, we need a whole webinar on vulvodynia of its own. <laughs> and <laughs> microbiome. And <laughs> microbiome. Yes. That's another, that's Kathy, another. can I ask you uh, to comment on the chronic candida? How do you treat it? As the, as the practitioner out there and the woman comes back and she's got thrush symptoms again and you swab mm. her and it grows again and how do you manage this? Yes. You can all chip in. 
Yeah, I think the first thing to do is, um, again, to go back to absolute basics mm. and to take a history. If it's um, recurrent thrush, it's often cyclical and it will often um, peak premenstrual and abate a bit naturally postmenstrual, in which case you can target your treatment for that period. For example, even some intravaginal azole for that time. Um, but I think it's important you do make sure it is thrush because the patient will often tell you they've got thrush. Mm. Yes. But, and we've already discussed that thrush is the word that's used for any myriad of symptoms. Mm. And um, quite a lot of chronic thrush I've found to be lichen sclerosis. Mm. And um, so I think, but given that you've done all that and you've taken your swabs and you're sure it is thrush, because it could also be bacterial vaginosis mm -hmm. or another recurrent uh, discharge, then um, we were discussing this earlier, it can be quite hard to find the guidelines on the treatment and they haven't been uh, obvious within the uh, antibiotic guidelines and they've been hidden with all due respect to Tanya in the dermatological That's I'm right. not responsible for this. <laughs> so, um, and there are many recipes for how mm. best to use it if you mm. use Diflucan, 150 milligrams. That's fluconazole, also, isn't it? Which yes. is fluconazole. If you use that um, weekly or 100 milligrams weekly, mm. some use 50 milligrams a day, mm -hmm. which I think is probably more than I would normally use. Yeah. And I think there's a little bit of trial and error, and I would go for the, um, the smallest dose that gave the um, suppression of the symptoms. And how long do you keep it going for? That's a great question. I would say for the first episode, six months. Yeah. yeah. So once, once you've say, got the condition, would you say right? six months? Yes, yeah. I think. And you'd say six months. Yeah. And I then what do you do when they come back and say, "I've stopped my medication. I've got my symptoms back." Yeah. Keep well, going. Yeah. Well, Reconfirm I would go back. that it is in fact Take the same again. diagnosis. You have mm, to start from right. scratch. Okay. And if you are dealing with the same problem again, sometimes you'll find it's a slightly different candida different resistance levels. So, and so, so that forth. raises the issue of Candida glabrata. Ah. And um, I can remember being rung by a pathologist telling me that I don't need to treat this mm. because it's really a commensural. Mm. Yet, the, yet the woman is presenting with, with symptoms yes. and discharge. Mm. So what do I do? Uh, I think you take you it seriously the um, in, in the context of the symptoms and the signs. Um, we also know that a lot of um, treatments, say with diflucan or any other um, frequently used antifungal, can select out yes. um, those that are more resistant mm -hmm. to um, uh, fluconazole, which will be things like candida glabrata. The other thing, people often forget that the discomfort can, even though, and this gets back to what we were talking about, um, true or not true, I don't, I, you know, if candida can trigger, and so candida may be well controlled, but you can still have burning and, and discomfort, that, and even a neuropathic itch. So the itch sometimes is actually um, not neuropathic, but a dysfunctional. Mm. Um, so how do you treat that? May I have that? Well, then you go back to the uh, vulvodynia guidelines, you treat them in parallel. But let's mm. say it's not that, you, you decided it's not that, and you've got candida glabrata. It's not meant to be as pathogenic because it doesn't have a hyphal form. The hyphal form is responsible for a lot of the virulence factors associated with candida. But, um, and it, but once it's there and we've decided it is and you take the swabs, probably boric acid, mm. um, but it's okay. again got about 70% effectiveness. Yeah. Well, vaginal suppressive, yes, the they vaginal. Are vaginal not okay. yeah. Conscious of the time, ladies. Mm -hmm. yes. We've had amazing questions, so thank you so much for sending in all your questions. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, we can't get to all of them. Can um, I do but, two more? Oh, yeah, no, 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 you've got time. I'm just <laughs> telling people, I, I'm apologising. We might not get to them, but we have still got some more coming. Okay. Oh, so, I just pre yeah. Sorry, just to complete the candida, mm. people who've been using lots and lots of anti-thrush medications, mm. particularly oh, off, this is great. over the yeah. counter, yes. they'll often come in, well they might have lichen sclerosis, and True. the other question is, <laughs> when did you, do, did you recently put any creams exactly. in your vagina? <laughs> because there's not much point taking a no. swab when they've no, just put out a syringe full of creams. And even if you've are. used fluconazole a week or two ago, we really need yes. no antifungal for about a month exactly. to take a meaningful um, swab. swab. And mm -hmm. also remember, if you're getting it on culture, in the absence of symptoms, 
it's probably the commensal status. Yes. We really like to see, um, to confirm a diagnosis on microscopy and in the association too with polymorphs. But um, yeast pseudo high fee on um, microscopy is always more meaningful. However, if someone is, on, uh, is symptomatic on fluconazole, and still got it on culture, you'd be suspicious that it is responsible for it. Yes. And okay. can you it off and you get a secondary dermatitis? I, I think that with a an lot of irritant the... contact dermatitis, particularly with topical azole yes. preparations, is very common. Mm. And you really do need your history and re-evaluation to determine what actually is the problem. Yeah. But yes, I agree yeah. with what you've said. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. That was a question. Okay. Now, we can might comment on oral nystatin. It's, it's um, not absorbed, so it's oral, oral nystatin won't um, help the vagina. Okay. Unless you apply Can we directly. move on to mm. some other questions? So um, are there any uh, natural therapies that could be used for the treatment of uh, vaginal dermatoses, say particularly lichen sclerosis? Is there anything that we know that's suitable? I think if you're trying to get itch relief, certainly um, the skin is dry, it can be broken, and anything that will help to moisten the skin will make any irritation, itch tingling feel better. In that situation, we have olive oil, coconut oil. Um, there what are about pawpaw creams? Pawpaw creams are often used, but they aren't all equal. So there will be occasions where women will use them and they'll be perfectly all right and find that they will relieve them and there will be other situations where they may work for a while and then things stop improving and that can mean that unfortunately they're developing an allergic reaction to it. So with all things you need to bear in mind that um, that may happen. But I think the thing to remember because there's so much advertising on the internet is that whilst these may well give you symptomatic relief, they're not actually going to ther be therapeutic for the management of the lichen sclerosis. So they're an adjunct therapy. Mm -hmm. And can I just sort of quickly ask mm. about um, probiotics? Everybody loves to talk about probiotics. What, where, what's their place in um, the Candida. Of Candida, management of Candida? I think the honest answer is we don't know enough yet. Yeah. Logic yeah. tells us the gut microbiome is incredibly important in our general well-being. Mm -hmm and even the vaginal microbiome, then alterations in that can unfortunately make a woman more susceptible to candida. Mm. I, f I feel as do I think all of us who work in this area that there are probiotics that are essential for maintaining um, good vulvovaginal health. We just haven't been able to identify them at the moment. Mm. And so going back to basics, maintaining a diverse and healthy diet of what's in season, when it's in season, means you're most likely to get what you need in the way of probiotics yes. from your diet. Mm. But in terms of lichen sclerosis, oh. even if someone's using something to help manage the itch, they still need the, the long-term treatment. Yes, they do, yeah. because okay. they actually... To prevent the damage. The relief of the symptom does not mean that you're yeah. taking away the future loss of tissue yeah. and the risk of cancer. It's yeah. not controlling the process. No, it's not, yeah. con exactly. Because yeah. it's Good an autoimmune. Yeah. Now, another question was, does, anyone, does everyone need to be referred to a gynecologist? You as the gynaecologist, Fantastic would you like question. to comment? <laughs> Everybody needs <laughs> to be referred to. We, we don't have enough work. Two minutes. No, no, I'm just joking. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Um, I think gynaecologists are learning about the vulva as much as any other profession, to mm. be honest. Yeah. And not every gynaecologist is a specialist in the vulva, mm. just like every gynaecologist is not a specialist in endosurgery. Yeah. Um, I think it's very much a, a team effort. There are dermatologists who are interested, sexual health physicians. Yeah. There are excellent GPs mm, who are yes, great resources out there. Yeah. And um, we've, we've had people train with us and then go back mm to um, the community. Do wonderful work. And Absolutely. there's also, yeah. um, let's not forget practice nurses. Yes. Um, yeah. And many of the um, practice nurses uh, who take pap smears, mm -hmm. I think, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
more expert in examining the vulva than many of the doctors I know. Mm. So I think that it depends on the individual. Yeah. Mm. And uh, does everybody need to be referred to a specialist is perhaps a better question. Yes. And I think that um, a team approach, some form of um, share care between the GP and yeah. the uh, or the nurse practitioner and the specialist would be ideal. Okay. If there were any concerns then uh, when to take a biopsy that we've already covered that would be a time we would want to see them but if um, there was good response to topical treatment and the patient was well and was being regularly at least every six months in the beginning and then an annual review and the tissues were stable and there was no damage and no symptoms, I would say that wouldn't necessarily require yeah. a specialist. This, this brings up um, that question of, yeah, uh, uh, of, of the young a, woman with a... need a specialist. By that you mean somebody who has an interest in vulval disease as opposed to a particular gynaecologist, dermatologist yeah. no, or whatever. That's what and I, 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 no, and I, I totally agree with that statement. So, we are now at the time for the take-home messages, please. Ah, yes. So I'm going to start with the first take-home message that you need to take a thorough history. So you've all heard this throughout the night with everything in medicine. Take a thorough history about the condition and ask direct questions because many women will not volunteer questions about their vulval symptoms or the urinary symptoms, the incontinence or any sexual symptoms as well. So we need to specifically ask those questions and once again examine the vulva. Not just have a quick peek but to actually part the labia and look. And you do that always when there are symptoms and secondly when you're doing a pap smear always look as well. I think the, uh, another important take home message is to recognise that vulval conditions, whether it's an eczema or whether it's lichen sclerosis, are chronic diseases, very much like diabetes and hypertension, so that they need long term careful management so that they do remain under control and any complications can be preempted and hopefully prevented. Okay, next one. And mine would be don't expect to do everything in the first visit. Um, time your visits, uh, plan a review uh, in say a couple of weeks, review again in a month um, and then develop a team. Do mm. everything as a team. Develop your own network of a team. And uh, my take home message would be that time is on your side, that a lot of these conditions have taken even years to develop and it's okay for us to take months to slowly in yeah. get people back to their health. Yes. It's not a quick fix. Yes, yes. absolutely. Fantastic. And these are some of the resources that uh, you can see up on your screen now and uh, I would like you also to, um, uh, to remind you that there is a national society, the Australian and New Zealand Volvo Vaginal Society and you can find an appropriate practitioner on their website. So please remember to use the resources and to use the societies. The Gene House has a vulval booklet. Please look online. If you want any copies of it, please let us know. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. Fantastic panel. I think there's just been so much great information tonight. So I hope that um, you've enjoyed tonight's seminar and realised that there's lots more obviously that we couldn't cover um, but we've covered some of the big ticket items and we've tried to um, address the questions that you've sent us. We will try and put together um, some of the other questions that we didn't get to tonight. We'll, we'll include them in our webinar library and the um, webinar will be ready hopefully by the end of next week. I won't give you a day but we will email you. So thanks so much for joining us for tonight's um, webcast. It's been uh, fabulous to have so many people. Um, we will email you next week. If you need um, a certificate for tonight as your CPD, for your CPD records or if you need RACGP points, stay tuned and complete the evaluation. Um, and thanks again to the wonderful panel for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.